See, desire, take. See, desire, take. This <clears throat> trio of words or concepts shows up a bunch of times in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's kind of like a hidden code, and I'm very excited to tell you about it today. So who's ready for some Hebrew grammar? Anybody? Yes, students, are we ready for some? All right, let's get into some Hebrew grammar. All right, so here's some basic concepts. Uh, these words, the way this usually works in the Old Testament is that somebody sees something, ra'ah. That's the, the Hebrew word ra'ah. They see something and that thing looks good or beautiful to them. And that good, beautiful, that's the word tov in Hebrew. And so they see something good and they desire or they covet that thing, hamad. And so what do they do? They take it, laka. All right. So they see, they desire something that looks beautiful or good and they take it. Now, that seems innocuous enough. It does not seem like that big of a deal. But the more you read in the Hebrew Bible, the more you realize that these words, when they show up in the story, they, and, and when they're put together like this, they symbolize something a little dark. What they symbolize is sin. And the consequences of that sin are usually pretty disastrous. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, first of all, there's this story in the Old Testament of a guy named Achan, and he was part of this, the, when they, you know, marched around Jericho, and God told the Israelites, do not take any of the plunder from Jericho. Like, don't take it for yourself. But he, well, he did. He took some, he hid it under his tent, and eventually he got found out. We're not going to get into all that today. But when he got found out, he confessed what he had done, and here's how he put it. He said, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw, ra'ah, right, a beautiful robe, a tov robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them, hamad, I wanted them so much that I took them, laka. See, desire, take. What Akan did was, was disobedient to what God had commanded, and it ended up causing a whole bunch of trouble for the Israelites. Okay, see, desire, take. Now, this same trio of words shows up in a story that might be even a little bit more familiar to many of us, the story of when King David raped Bathsheba. Here's what that story says. Uh, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed or saw Ra'ah, a woman of unusual beauty, Tov, taking a bath. Then David sent messengers to get, to take her, Laka. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. See, desire, take. King David, in that moment, he misused his authority and he disobeyed God. He did, in other words, what was right in his own eyes. And this choice, if you keep reading in the story, it led to death and broken relationships and trouble for the kingdom. It was a mess because it was sin. Now, there are other examples of see, desire, take that we could look at. I could talk to you for a while about this, but there's really only one that you need to remember. And it's easy to remember because it happens to be the very first sin in the Bible. All right, in the book of Genesis, when, when uh, God has, has created this beautiful, abundant paradise for the humans to live within, he gives them one command, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and tov, and, or sorry, of tov and ra, of good and bad. So here's what happens. Uh, the, the serpent uh, comes and deceives the woman, and this, this is what happens. She, Eve, saw, ra'ah, that the tree was, what? Beautiful, tov. And its fruit looked delicious, so she wanted it. I mean, kamad. She wanted the wisdom that it would give her, so she took, laka, some of the fruit, and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Okay, by the way, Adam, come on, man. You heard the command from God and you're standing there this whole time and you're just going along with it, dude. All right, anyway, sorry. This is as much his fault as hers. Okay, it was this choice 
this, this choice on their part, on the human's part, to do what seemed right in their own eyes. That fruit sure does look good. It was that choice that brought sin and death into this world. See, desire, take. Right? See, desire, take. Here's why I bring all this up. Because the biblical authors, they are trying through this little Hebrew wordplay here, they are trying to, to show us that there is a pattern in human behavior. A pattern, something that's kind of fundamental about the state of our world. The pattern is this. Selfish desires lead to sin and sin corrupts the world. Sin breaks the world, right? This is the pattern and we are all caught up in it. See, desire, take. So what do we do about this? How do we break the pattern? How do we, how do we avoid doing what so many of our spiritual ancestors have done and further break the world? Well, that is what we're talking about today. As Jeff said, this is the second week of our four-week series called Refocus, where we are exploring what the Bible has to say about a practice that is kind of fundamental for all Christ followers, the practice of moral integrity. And here's how we define moral integrity for those of you who weren't here last week. Uh, basically, it's this. Disciples of Jesus reject the corruption of sin— and reflect Christ to the world as image bearers of God. So, yes, what we are talking about here is four weeks focused on the topic of sin, which I know is about as fun sounding as a root canal, right? But I promise this is not the kind of series you might be expecting. Uh, my hope over these four weeks as we explore this concept is to, is to present you with perhaps a different approach than you might expect. Okay, rather than this topic being about shame or condemnation or, or a list of arbitrary God rules to follow, what we're talking about this month is really identity. Identity. And it's actually a really positive thing because it's all about becoming the person that you were created to be and in so doing, discovering your best possible life. So why don't, we, uh, why don't we pray, and then I'll give you a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last week, and we'll keep the process going, all right? So let's pray together. Father God, I know that uh, in the church, we have, we've had a lot to say about sin over the years, and I also know, Father, that there are a lot of, of, there's a lot of baggage that we may be bringing into this topic. And so, Father, I pray that as we spend this time together, you would just unload that baggage from our mind and allow us to just hear your voice uh, in the process. I pray that as I'm speaking, I would simply disappear and that your Holy Spirit would remain. I ask that you'd give us all ears to hear what you have to say this morning. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so in case you weren't here last week, let me bring you up to speed and maybe remind everybody else uh, of what we talked about. Uh, last Sunday, I, I kicked off this series by describing two groups of people, two groups of people that I kind of see pretty regularly within the church. The first group of people are what I'll call the, um, the sin management people. Uh, sin management, this is a way of thinking about sin that's really all about how you look to other people. It's all about kind of putting on a performance where you, you do all the right things, you look all shiny and happy and godly in public, but you really don't pay a whole lot of attention to any of the deeper, darker, hidden things um, because it's all a show. That's sin management. Some of us fall into that camp and we kind of have the habit of making our, our sin management performative. On the other side, the other extreme, we have a group that I'll call the you do you group. You do you. This is kind of almost a reaction to sin management because this is a group of people who would say, I am sick of all the condemnation. I'm sick of all the judgment. I'm sick of the show. I'm just going to do what seems right to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide for myself what is right and wrong, and you can't tell me what to do. Okay? Now, as I 
said on the, on the, we have a, a podcast that between Sundays is what it's called, and it happens between Sundays, as you might imagine. Um, but we talked a little bit more about the fact that pretty much nobody is on one extreme or the other. Most of us probably have a little bit of both you do you and sin management in our lives. But regardless, those two groups, in my opinion, kind of miss some of the fundamental things that the Bible has to say about sin. I think they're missing the, the, the Bible's call to true morality. So what is that call then? If, if they're getting it wrong, what is this call? Well, this is what we talked about last week. We talked about how from the very beginning, humans were created in the image of God. Right? That's the, the fundamental bit of our identity that we have to start with. We were created in the image of God. We were designed, uh, in other words, to be living representatives of God's love and his abundance and his life to this world. That's what an image does. We reflect the one who created us. But, and this is where the narrative conflict comes in, instead of trusting in his wisdom and, and accurately reflecting God's character to the world, we decided from the beginning, and we just looked at that first example of this, we decided to do what seemed right in our own eyes. See, desire, take. We, we see what we want, we desire it, and so we take it even if it's exactly the opposite of what God desires for us. In other words, sin is this, this uh, act of rejecting God's intentions for the world. That rejection is what sin is. And it leads to, that's why we see murder and rape and injustice and addiction and lust and greed and gossip and rage, right? We could go on and on and on. That's all sin. Because of that sin, because of that rejection of God's desires, the image of God in us is disfigured, right? We were created as God's image, but because of sin, that image is disfigured. And last week, we, we used this metaphor of like art, fine art, paintings. We are, we are in a way, we are a masterpiece of a, of a master painter, and yet like a beautiful painting that, that gets covered in soot and grime and filth and scars and rips in the canvas, sin has warped who we were meant to be. We're still that image, but we are disfigured. And so instead of radiating out God's life into our creation, we are curved in on ourselves. We're self-focused. See, desire, take. See, desire, take, right? It's on and on. When you look at humanity, you are supposed to see with your own eyes God's desires at work. But what do you see instead? You see our desires. Things have gotten warped, disfigured. The masterpiece of God's image is kind of hard to see. Thankfully, and this is the good news. Our God is a master art restorer, so to speak. When we put our trust in Jesus, who again was the perfect image of God, you look at him and you see the Father. When we put our trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit does something remarkable to us. He begins to, to clean the canvas to restore uh, faded colors back to vibrancy. He, he, he makes the image of God in us shine out once more. Because of God's grace, we can break free of sin's power and become the conduits of God's life and abundance and healing that we were always meant to be. Again, moral integrity is not about rules. It's about identity. Dealing with sin, dealing with the sin in our lives, the sin in our world, it matters. It matters. Not because we're putting on a show, sin managers, and not because we're being legalistic, you do you folks, but because it is time for what has been disfigured in us to be restored. That's why sin matters. So that's what we talked about last week. <laughs> about ready to, to take our next step on this journey. And here's what the next step is. Uh, we, we've defined the problem, 
We've defined the, the fact that God's grace has allowed for a solution, but what actually is our next step? Where does, does moral integrity begin? I mean, if it's not about lists of rules of what to do and not do, then, then what is the positive thing that we are supposed to be focused on? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, and I think the answer can be found in something that Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark. So I'd love for you to open one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you of your, or your own Bible and turn to Mark chapter 12. Um, it'll be page 842 in the House Bibles, and we're going to take a look at what he says. Now, while you're turning there, I'll give you just a little bit of context. Um, in the Old Testament law, or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, there are, by some estimates, 613 individual commands from God. 613. And so, you know, I said it's not about rules, but there are a lot of specific rules in the Torah. Now, here's what kind of happened by the time of Jesus. Uh, Jewish rabbis and thinkers would, would spend a lot of time discussing these 613 commands. Which ones were the most important? How far does this one go? How do you interpret this one, right? They'd have all these discussions, and then later rabbis would have discussions about those discussions and, and so on. It became this whole, this whole cottage industry. And so that's what we see happening here. There's a, a local Bible nerd in Jerusalem who wants to get Jesus' take as a rabbi on one of the hot questions of his day. So here's what happens in verse 28 of Mark 12. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. And he realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Okay, so from Jesus' perspective, according to him, the foundation of obedience to the law, in other words, the, the foundation of moral integrity, is found in these two specific ideas. Number one, idea one, is love the Lord your God with all your heart and your uh, soul and your mind and your strength. So in other words, your whole self, every bit of you, love the Lord. And idea two, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, some people simplify this even further, and they say it all boils down to love God and love others. And that's a pretty good summary of these, of these two commands. So to Jesus, of all the 613 commands in the Old Testament, these are the two that, that are at the very, very top. These are the most important. Which sounds great. I mean, it is great. Jesus said it. It's, it's great. It's clear. But here's my problem with this, is on the surface, it's not very practical. Like, it, yes, love God, love others, but what do I actually do when I'm faced with a moral quandary? Any of you guys uh, have one of those what would Jesus do bracelets? Anybody? WWJD, right? I see. Okay, so apparently these are coming back. 90s are back in so many more ways than I understood. It's for the kids. That's awesome. Um, but the idea with WWJD is like, well, if you're faced with a challenging circumstance, just do what Jesus would do, which is great, but what would he do, <laughs> right? It doesn't actually answer that question. So maybe that same thing is happening here. We're left with a little bit of confusion. So that would be the case if it wasn't for the fact that the New Testament uh, uh, writers and the apostles and Jesus himself had a specific way of using the Old Testament. When they quote something from the Old Testament, rarely, if ever, are they only wanting to get across the specific words of what they're quoting. You see, back in the day, people couldn't really read for most part, so instead they memorized. They memorized the Bible. So when somebody quotes a specific passage, um, they expect that their readers are going to have all of the surrounding context of that passage come to mind. It's like the way today we would say, if, if someone were to say, we the people, 
you know, that doesn't mean really much by itself. What it means comes from the fact that it's a quote from the U.S. Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. And so when people say, we the people, they're referring to the ideas of the laws that the nation was founded on or our values, that they want all of that other stuff to come to mind. The same thing is happening here. And so I want to do something really fun. This is my favorite thing to do is I want to show you the context in the Old Testament for what Jesus was saying when he's quoting, because I really think it brings a whole lot of new nuance to what he's saying here. So let's start with this, this first command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength. There's a lot more going on here than just a vague concept of love God. Let me show you. Uh, this passage that he's quoting is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 2. If you want to turn there and take a look yourself, it'll be page 155. So here's what it says in, in its context, in Deuteronomy. It says, If you obey all God's decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you. And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And then here's the quote. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So that's the passage in its context. Immediately what I notice is, is that... Yes, this, this is still all about obedience, right? It's obey, it says obey his decrees and commands. But, but it's all throughout this passage. That obedience is directly tied to abundance. To abundance. It's, you will enjoy a long life. All will go well with you. You're going to have a bunch of kids in a land of milk and honey, right? It's all about abundance. Now we see the point of loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength is not because if you don't, I'm going to blast you. No, the point is because walking in line with God's desires, obeying what he says is right, being his image in the world, that is how you experience his abundance. This is the key to a vibrant life. All will go well with you. That's what he's saying here. Now, Scripture makes it really clear what the alternative is. The alternative to this way of living is see, desire, take. See, desire, take. That, that, rather than listening to God's wisdom, when we do that, we do what seems right in our own eyes. And that inevitably leads to pain and broken relationships and injustice and death. That's what sin does. It breaks the world. We curve in on ourselves. And we end up twisted and disfigured and we miss out on the abundant life that God has created for us. But if our whole self is oriented towards God, well, that's when the story begins to change. Setting aside our, our selfish desires and surrendering to the will of God is the key to flourishing and abundance. Surrender to the will of God. Frankly, all moral integrity comes from that fundamental posture. That's where it begins. Surrender to the will of God. In other words, a rejection of see, desire, take. It is a rejection of that tendency that we have to do what seems right in our own eyes. No, we don't do what seems right in our eyes. We learn from and listen to and, and try to adapt to what seems right in his eyes. That is the fundamental posture. And that is why Jesus calls this the most important commandment. We love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And when we do, the image of God is restored in us and we can finally come alive. I'll say this again. This is not about heavy-handed legalism. It is about living into the abundance that God desires for us. The abundance that he created us to live within. All 
All right, so how do we know what seems right in God's eyes? Like, how do we know the actual things that we're supposed to do? Uh, what rules, commands, whatever do we, do we follow? That's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to get into that. We're going to start to get a, a little bit practical. For now, though, I just want us to understand that biblical morality begins with a posture that looks like this. It's a posture of surrender. That is where it begins. A willingness to ask, God, what do you want me to do? That's where it starts. So before we move on, let's just take a second and do a little bit of self-evaluation. I want to give you a moment to ask yourself and maybe with God's presence, uh, asking God how you've been doing with this posture recently. All right? Uh, think about the last few months, let's say. Last few months for you. Would you say that in general your life has been defined by self-interest? See, desire, take. Is your life, is your, is your moral life guided by you do you, in other words? Or have your actions and decisions and words been driven by a deep and profound love of God? Has it been defined by you seeking His wisdom and desires even, and maybe even especially when those desires don't align with your own? Has that been your posture? I'll give you a couple seconds just to think about that. Ask God, how have you been doing? Okay, so a posture of, of surrender to the will of God. That is the starting point of moral integrity. And the next step, the next thing that you're supposed to do, it follows really closely behind it. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is sometimes referred to as the golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, now, it by itself, it, it makes sense on its own. Right? This is a really good phrase to live by in general. Uh, it, it, it's just a, it's a good thought. But guys, when you look at the context that this grows out of, what Jesus is quoting here, which again, his, his original hearers would have been thinking of, the context, when you read it in context, I got to tell you, you'll, you'll see, it, it brings a whole bunch of new uh, perspective to this passage. So I'm going to read this. This is this quote comes at the end of what is kind of a, a lengthy list of different commands, some of those 613 commands. But I want you to pay attention. See if you can figure out what is the common thread running through these commands. Okay, see if you can catch this. Here we go. Verse 11 of Leviticus 19. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to swear falsely, I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not twist justice in legal matters by, favoring, uh, by uh, favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay. You see the common thread in all of this? Don't cheat one another. Don't insult the deaf. Don't spread gossip. Don't ignore the plight of your neighbor. The common thread here is that all of these actions, if we were to do these things we're commanded not to do, they threaten the peace and harmony and well-being of a community. 
right? These are sins because when you do them, they disfigure the image of God in you. Again, this all boils down to see, desire, take. Let me, let me give you some examples here. Uh, for example, Leviticus says, do not steal. Well, why would I steal? Well, I would steal because I see something that you have, and guess what? I desire it, so I take it. See, desire, take. And this action, this is sin because it disfigures the image of God in me. I was created to represent the abundance of God in my world. But when I'm stealing, I am representing scarcity. That's not what God desires. Another example, why would, why would anyone cause the blind to stumble or insult the deaf? Or, or spread gossip. Why would people do that? Well, because when they see an opportunity to make themselves look superior and they desire the affirmation and the, the attaboys of, of other people, they take this opportunity to punch downwards. They take advantage of other people. Again, this is, this is a, a disfigurement of who we were meant to be. I was created to reflect the other's focused love of God. But when I do these things, instead I'm reflecting my own brokenness, my own insecurities, and that stuff spreads. Hurt people hurt people. It breaks the world. One more example. Uh, verse 18 says, uh, don't seek revenge. Well, why would you seek revenge? Well, you seek revenge because you see the wrong that someone else has done to you. You desire retribution, so you take from them what they took from you. You were created to, to pay the grace of God forward as his image. But instead, when you do this, when you seek retribution, the only thing you're paying forward is more hatred and harm. Again, sin is not about breaking a list of rules. It is about the corruption of our identity, of who we were created to be and the world that we were created to inhabit. That's why this stuff matters. Here's the point. When we pursue our own selfish desires, when we're twisted in on ourselves, and we think we're doing what's best for us, all we're doing is further breaking the world and in the process, it actually robs us of life and abundance and joy. The very thing that we think we can somehow manhandle into existence. It robs us. So what's the solution to this? What do we, what do, we do with this? Well, according to Leviticus 19 and according to Jesus, we love our neighbor as ourselves. So let's think about what that means, to love our neighbor as ourself. On one hand, it means acting towards our neighbors as you would want them to act towards you, which is like you want people to speak kindly to you, so speak kindly to other people. You want your, your neighbor to, to come through for you when you're in trouble, so you should help your neighbor, right? Uh, you want to be judged fairly, so judge other people fairly. This is the kind of behavior that brings healing to communities and ultimately healing to the world. Loving your neighbor as yourself then is not just some like warm and fuzzy feeling like, oh, I love you. No, this is, this is a posture, a commitment. Loving your neighbor as yourself is a lifestyle, a lifestyle of setting yourself aside. It's a way of living that imitates the self-giving love of Jesus. Jesus, remember, the perfect image of God. What did he do? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. If Christ was willing to do that for us, then what are we willing to do for our neighbor? Because we are also created in the image of God. So again, let's just take a moment for some self-reflection. Okay, I want to ask you, are you living with this posture? 
this posture of self-giving love? Do you routinely set your own desires aside for the sake of others? Or is your life generally governed by seed, desire, take? Is that how you live? Think about the last few months again, and just ask yourself with God's help, what is the posture that you've taken towards others? So, Jesus was asked, which of the 613 commands in the Old Testament law were the most important? And he responds with two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. When we look at these commands in their original context, it is so clear to me that Jesus is not just giving some clever answer to a, a theological debate of his time. No, he is laying out a fundamental vision for the posture that his followers should take when it comes to moral integrity in a broken world. Number one, we take a posture of surrender to the will of God. This means rejecting the allure of self, breaking the cycle of see, desire, take, and asking with, with our lives, with our relationships, with our decisions, God, what do you desire here? Surrender to the will of God. And number two, self-giving love. This means asking, again, making your primary focus something other than yourself. Not doing what seems right in your eyes, but doing what seems right for someone else. Asking God, what do you desire for this relationship? Instead of see, desire, take, it's kind of like see, love, give. As the image of God, this is what you were created to do. And it is the key to your best possible life. A life of abundance, a life of peace, a life of joy. True life begins with the death of your selfish desires. The question is, do you trust God enough to take that posture? Let's pray. Well, Father, I recognize as we talk about this that this is kind of the fundamental uh, conflict in the Bible. Every single generation of your people has struggled to get this right. So I don't expect that we are overnight just going to learn how to do this. And yet, we have the, the gift of living on the other side of Christ's death and resurrection. We get to live with your Holy Spirit within us. And so, Father, I do feel like we have the, the capability of doing something that the ancient Israelites couldn't. We have the ability to actually grow in this, to have that image restored by the master restorer. And so God, my prayer for each one of us this week, this month, this year, is that you would shape us to resemble Jesus in the way we live, the way that we uh, surrender to your will, the way that we love our neighbors as ourselves with self-giving love. Father, I pray that you would kindle in us a desire to live with open palms. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us the strength to do it, especially, especially when it's hard. So Father, would you shape us to be like Jesus, the perfect image of you. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church. And the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.